Hello, Hollywood Times viewers. Judy Shields here. We are so happy to welcome back Mark Anthony, JD Psychic Explorer, also known as Psychic Lawyer. Mark recently won the OMI Award for Best Psychic Median. Hey, Mark, thank you for joining us today. It's so great to see that smile of yours. Oh, thank you, Judy. It's always great talking to you. It's it's like um it's like reconnecting with a family member. And and I really appreciate it. And you know, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. So for the afterlife frequency, I mean, research, what research, you know, did did you have for that book? I mean, I started reading it and it's one of those ones where you really have to kind of pay attention. And so, folks, you know, it's an amazing book. You start to read it. If you have to put it down because your brain isn't catching up, just pick it up and just really read it. Because once you catch on, you can't put it down, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, this has been lifetimes of research from everything from near-death experiences to quantum physics to biology. Mm -hmm. um, then I combine that with philosophy and theology. And, and Judy's right. There's a lot of science in there, but I illustrate it through fast-moving stories. Yeah. You know, so so it's not an algebra textbook. I try to write my, my uh, books like a juicy novel. And the thing is, Judy, I suffered through so many boring books in law school and in oh, the practice wow. of law. I don't want to inflict that on anyone. But what I love about when Judy reads my book, some people just go for the stories and they they zoom through. Judy actually <laughs> reads it the way it should be read. She absorbs it and she'll put it down yeah. and, and, and let it sink in because each chapter introduces mm -hmm. concept or concepts that you need for the next chapter. But um, it... it um, it was a great honor uh, writing that book and then getting the endorsements that I did from some of the top afterlife and near-death experience researchers and scientists in the world. So there, there was a lot that that went into the afterlife frequency. It took me the better part of five years uh, to write it and closer to 10 on the research. Oh, wow. I didn't, didn't know that. It's also won multiple awards. Talk about the awards that it's won. Uh, I've been very honored. It won the Coalition of Visionary Resources Award for the best book in reincarnation, grief, death, and dying. It won Best Holistic Life Magazine's uh, Most Inspirational Book of the Year. And it won Ohm Times Award for Best Metaphysical Book of the Year. And it was also considered for a Pulitzer Prize. Um, I was also deeply um, honored when film icon Shirley MacLaine uh, oh. recommended it uh, as well. So, um, you know, I, I, I cool. love but when Shirley MacLaine, because she, aside from being an incredible movie star, she's in her 90s and she, she got a new movie coming out. I mean, it, it's funny. It's like Shirley MacLaine and Carol Burnett, you know, yes. they're women in their 90s. We all know who they are if you're, you're involved in film. And they show no signs of slowing down. And, and I think they're amazing. And um, I, I was honored actually to do a reading for, for Shirley MacLaine, which was, which was incredible. Wow. And then when the book came out, um, her newsletter um, um, was released. And I was shocked when I saw, I found this book and I highly recommend it. She, she just wrote, just had beautiful things to say about the afterlife frequency. So there you go, folks, <laughs> you know, those, you don't get one, you get all three, you know, and read them in that order because it's, it will change your life for sure. Uh, there's a term developed, uh, electromagnetic soul. What, explain that. The electromagnetic soul, we know from, um, from every great spiritual teacher, we're going back 5,000 years to, to the sages of ancient India, the, the world's oldest religion, Hinduism. Then if you go to Zoroaster, um, which was you know the Zoroastrian religion, which is the religion of the Persian Empire, and at one time was the most influential religion in the world, then to Moses, to Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Confucius, Lao Tzu, Paramahansa, Yogananda, the religions of the Pacific and pre-Columbian religions, animistic religions of Africa, all the way up through St. Francis of Assisi to Gandhi, uh, Mother Teresa, all the way up to today. Every great spiritual teacher and belief system teaches us, Judy, that the spirit, um, the soul, uh, in science known as consciousness, 
pre-exists the body, comes into the body, moves on after the body dies. And the debate on consciousness has been going on uh, for thousands of years. I mean, Aristotle in his asked the question, what came first, the chicken or the egg? What he was actually teaching in his school of Athens was he was asking what came first, the consciousness or the brain, the body. And so this is one of those questions that has just mystified in, uh, people for, for thousands of years. Well, we know from the laws of thermodynamics and physics that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. The science, um, the field of neuroscience, the study of the human brain, we know that the brain has an electromagnetic field. And here's what's cool about the brain. It's 2% of the body's weight, yet it uses over 20% of the body's electrical activity. Biggest user is the heart which makes sense. It's a pump and we yeah. want that electricity pumping. <laughs> okay. But, but the thing is, um, we also know with energy, neither being created nor destroyed, um, the brain has this electrical field that the brain did not create consciousness. It only hosts it the way a computer hard drive hosts the programs on it. So after years of research, I developed the term, the electromagnetic soul to describe what we really are, which is pure consciousness, a soul, a spirit, that is eternal electromagnetic energy. Mm. Oh, man, it all just, you know, when you explain it in our a layman's terms, it just makes you realize that, you know, we understand more of what you write about. Because, you know, there's times when you question, like, what is this? And thank you for that. Well, you have to put it in in terms people can understand. And, you know, we hear a lot in the metaphysical um, realm, we're all interconnected. I mean, you always hear that. Yeah. And then, you know, you hear like Jesus teaching, we're all brothers and sisters. Guess what? Buddha said that too. Yeah. And so did, so did Krishna. So did Muhammad. They all, they all say that. Yeah. And interconnectedness, it's a nice term to fling around, but let's look at quantum physics. Yeah. We know everything's made of molecules, which in turn are composed of atoms, <clears throat> which are comprised of electrons, protons, and neutrons, which in turn are made of the smallest particle, a quantum. And that's where the word quantum physics comes from. And a quantum is electromagnetic energy. And what this means is everything. That means you and me, Judy, the microphones we're talking into, the radio waves, this show is being broadcast on, the light of the sun, the rings of Saturn and beyond are, guess what? At the subatomic level, all the, all the same form of electromagnetic energy. They just vibrate at different frequencies. So, for example, this pen and me on the subatomic level are the same form of em energy it's just that i have a different frequency than it does and so this went into electromagnetic souls so that when we die think your brain it's 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 like a computer hard drive it didn't create the ems it just hosts it and then so your body your brain dies and the ems like a drop of water then plunges into this eternal sea of souls that I refer to as the collective consciousness. Okay. Yeah. And, and so you can call it heaven, the other side, nirvana. But once again, there is a sound scientific explanation for all of this. And that's that's the reason that I wrote The Afterlife Frequency. Yeah, that, I, I noticed you talk about, uh, you know, near-death experience, uh, which is NDE. So have you had one of those you've i mean many people must tell you about that how do you feel um I, i'm smiling because yes i have had an nde um both of my parents have had near-death experiences my father had two of them my mother had one when i was a teenager and um my dad he was about 16 years old and he was in a terrible car accident and he said uh, he was driving. He was, you know, he became a Navy SEAL. So this was not a tame boy. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and he said he was floating about 30 feet above the accident. And he sees the car there and all these people pull him out and they're doing compressions on his chest. And he, he said, I'm dead. This feels great. He said, I felt like I was flowing. He said, then there was this light and it addressed him by his name. It said, Earl it is not your time. 
And dad said, the next thing he knew, he was back in my body. And he said, it hurt like hell. <laughs> well, then uh, probably, you no, know, it, was, it was about 10 years later. This was before I was born. My dad was a scuba diver and he was diving with um, um, a group of divers off of New Jersey. And he was in about 125 feet of water and all of a sudden his regulator jammed. Now, this is back in the early days of, of tanks in the Aqualung. They didn't have any backup systems or anything like that. And he said he started sucking water, and he said that was it. I was drowning. And he said, the next thing I know, there was the light again. And he said, I'm dead. And the, he said, the voice said, Earl, it's still not your time. And he said, I remember him telling, telling me, he goes, Mark, to this day, I'll never know how it happened, but suddenly... My regulator started working and I was able to clear my mask. And then when my mother was, uh, I was 17, my mother, um, it was a terrible thing that happened to her. Um, uh, she had Crohn's disease and her intestines burst and she was rushed to the hospital. She died on the table. And I'll never forget, Judy, the surgeon came out and said, we think we're going to lose her. And my dad stood up and he grabbed the doctor's coat and he said, if she dies, you die. And I mean, my brother and I were like, whoa. I mean, he was always dad. And all of a sudden he turned into Rambo. And then this, and anyway, they went back in there and they started working on my mom and they brought her back. OK. And she said that she left her body and she went into the light and she saw Giovanna, um, her grandmother. She saw her father. She saw um, all these people that she knew who had died. And they all told her, Jeannie. You have to go back. So with my NDE, it occurred when I was four years old, and I would love to tell the story, but it is so germane to the lessons that I teach in the afterlife frequency, I'm going to have to ask um, people that it you'll have to read about it for yourself. There you go. <laughs> That's what I'd say. I also uh, read about like shared death experience. What What is that? Shared death experiences are fascinating and they've been recorded for thousands of years. It's when one or more people have the same near death experience. Hmm. And um, I'll give a little bit away from, from my book. Um, hot shots. Hot shots are the special forces of firefighters. And there was this team of hot shots and they were sent to a mountain fire. Okay, mountains, the weather changes uh, rapidly and they're on this mountaintop trying to control this forest fire and suddenly the, the wind shifted direction and the fire was coming at them at 100 miles an hour. That, that's how fast it can move. And being super trained, they immediately hit the ground, put protective gear over them. And, and this one guy said he, he could feel the oxygen being sucked out of the air. And the next thing he knew, he was floating over the mountaintop. And he looked around and he saw all of his other hot shots looking at him. And one of the guys on the team had been born with a deformed foot. And he saw the guy's foot and it was normal. And the guy said, hey, my foot's normal. And the next thing he realized is he came face to face with his great grandfather and he had a discussion with him. And the grandfather said, you have to go back. Next thing he knows, he's on the ground coughing and he pulls the protective gear off of him and he's hacking and, and wheezing and he sees the other hot shots. They're going through the same thing. And these guys regroup. Now, these are the best of the best. This is like the Delta Force, the Navy SEALs, the firefighters. These are no-nonsense guys. Yeah. And they all start talking, and they all said, I saw you. I saw you, too. We saw Jose's foot was right. They all had the same near-death experience. Now, how do you account for that? Well, all their electromagnetic souls left their bodies and their vibration and their EM fields began to overlap. Now, let's take shared death experiences to something that most people may be able to relate to. Um, people who are terminally ill and who are dying will oftentimes talk about seeing deceased loved ones. 
And um, I think one of the, once again, Hollywood times, I'll tell this one. The last of the Golden Girls, Betty White. Oh. She, she was married to Alan Ludden. Um, he was a game show host. She met him in the 1960s. And I believe he died in 1981, uh, right around there. And Betty White and Alan Ludden were the love of each other's lives. I mean, the, when they met, it was automatic chemistry. And she died on New Year's Eve, I believe, of 2022 at age 99. She was going to be 100 like in, in another two weeks. Yeah. And in fact, she'd even given an interview a couple, like about a month or so before that, and she was still sharp as a tack, but she was in declining health. And her her caretaker and actress, Vicki Lawrence, who used to play Mama, you know, Mama's yeah. Family and on the yeah. Carol Burnett show, said that at the last moment, Betty White looked up, smiled and said, Alan, and then she died. Oh, he came to get her. He came to get her. Yeah. Well, hospices, healthcare providers have noticed that people who are in transition, that family members, close friends, healthcare workers in close proximity to the dying person will also start seeing the spirits that the person who's dying is is communicating with and at the precise moment of death and i've been at i've been called in in my capacity as a medium a number of times when people are dying and sometimes um people who are not mediums they'll see a flash of light come out of the body at death they'll hear beautiful music they get a sense that they're rising up off the floor um and they get like this dizzy sensation at the time of the person's death <laughs> What's going on there is as the person's electromagnetic soul is detaching from the body, its frequency is expanding, and our electromagnetic souls, our EM fields start interacting with theirs. That's why we'll, we'll see the spirits that they're seeing. We may see the energy of their EMS leaving the body, which is the flash of light. We may hear sounds associated with the other side, see colors we can't describe, because for a few brief moments, we're caught up in the transitional process of someone going from the material world into spirit, which is also another form of a shared death experience. So people who are not an imminent threat of dying still get caught up in the EMS. And for anyone who's experienced this, it is an absolutely beautiful experience. And I think it brings a lot of comfort when you realize my loved one didn't die. They went into the light and they were created by so many loved ones. I just, to me, I think that is, is so comforting. Yeah, <clears throat> it is, you know, to, to be like a caregiver for someone and them, you see them in a different childlike state and they're like, doing better and all of a sudden they're having a conversation and you're like, who are you talking to? And they'll say like, Oh, uh, my husband. And you're like, you know, that husband is gone. And it's like, and then this happened to me. And then the person died shortly after that in my arms. It's like, it's, it just makes that moment of grief and sadness, a blessing that, you know, their husband came to, to take them home, you know, and it was time. It's an amazing thing to experience, you know? Yeah, very much so. I also wanted to ask, um, like, does your book deal with issues like uh, PTSD, survivor's guilt, homicide? Most definitely. Um, all of us suffer from PTSD to some degree. Normally, when we think of post, you see, you, un you understand that too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Normally, when we think of post-traumatic stress disorder, we think of military. They used to call it um, shell shock, then battle okay. fatigue, um, but post-traumatic stress disorder. And what's interesting, I was reading a historical document and the analysis, it said that um, some of the knights who returned from the Crusades during the Middle Ages exhibited signs of PTSD from all the horrors that they, you know, were, were encountering. So this is part of the human condition because, you know, most people aren't ruthless, you know, killers. And, and when you see someone you love died or you're in a battle um, uh, situation, um, it, it leaves a scar on you. It's traumatic and PTSD. 
And the afterlife frequency helps people understand PTSD and and also how to to engage in behaviors and therapies that help alleviate it. Um, if you are a family member of somebody who was murdered, certainly you suffer from PTSD. You don't have to witness the death to be traumatized by it. And murder is a horrible thing. Murder is an absolutely horrible thing. And sadly, it happens so much more than, than we think. And so it's very important to confront these. And also one of the, the greatest healing modalities for PTSD and coping with loss is spirit communication. And as a medium, that's what I do. Um, people come to me either on the telephone or at personal events, and I facilitate communication between people here and their loved ones in spirit. And spirit communication through a legitimate medium can alleviate some of the, the stress uh, that, that uh, contributes to PTSD and certainly can help put things in perspective. We have to keep in mind, Judy, that there's no magic wand that anyone can wave to make you all better. Um, it's, it's a lifetime journey, and spirit communication is a healing step in the journey through grief. Well, leading into that, explain to us what is spiritual situational awareness? Spiritual situational awareness is a term that, that I've developed. Um, spirit, uh, situational awareness, once again, military first responders. This is a very valued skill. It's paying attention to everything that's going around you all at once. Okay. And spiritual situational awareness takes that and expands it into paying attention to the spiritual influences around you as well. Let's go back to the story of my, my Aunt Marjorie. Yes, she had a premonition, but her spiritual situational awareness, she was picking up on a message from spirits that were warning her about her husband. Um, people um, will oftentimes tell me, all of a sudden, um, I just felt I needed to be at that particular place, and you find yourself in the right place at the right time. Um, if, if we have time for a, a, another story, um, Rocky, my business manager, I know Judy knows Rocky. Rocky's awesome. She travels with me, and she's got a very highly developed sense of situational awareness, and I had just finished speaking at a conference and we were in Salt Lake City and we went out to Antelope Island to explore, you know, uh, the Great Salt Lake. And and after that, we wanted to have a picnic lunch, you know, back in the suburbs of uh, of Salt Lake. And the GPS kept making us go in circles. We kept trying to find and we it kept taking us to this park. Now, as a medium, my spiritual situational awareness said you know, we need to stop fighting this. I don't think this is an electrical anomaly. We're supposed to be here. And Rocky said, okay, then let's have a picnic lunch. And we get out of the, the rental car and we found a picnic table and there were some, some trees, you know, so we had some shade. And so we're setting up. And this was at a public park. There were swing sets, you know, in the distance. And there was a public restroom, maybe about a hundred feet near us. Okay. So we're having our lunch and we see this little girl. She's about four years old. And she's um, standing in front of the public restroom. And then I get this creepy feeling, and so did Rocky. This car pulls up near that, and this guy gets out, and he starts making a beeline for this little girl. And before I could say anything, Rocky was on her feet, and she goes, something bad's about to happen. And I said, all right, you approach the girl because Rocky's petite, and I'll keep an eye on the guy. And she, she hurries up to the little girl, and she gets between him and the guy, and she goes to the little girl, do you know who this man is? She goes, no. And he turns and runs back to the car, jumps in, and, and I'm trying to get his license plate, but he took off before I could, you know, I could get a picture of it. Oh. He was going to snatch that little girl. And she said, who are you here with? And she said, my Nana. She goes, where's your Nana? And she took her um, around about, about 100 feet away. And there's this woman there reading a book. And Rocky walked up and said, is this your granddaughter? Um, she goes, yeah. She, and she explained what, what happened. And the woman burst into tears and said, oh, my God, I'll never let her out of my side again. And the spiritual situational awareness. We could have just said, oh, the GPS, you know, it's malfunctioning and all this. 
But after the third time, there was a reason we were supposed to be there. And then combining that with Rocky's sense of intuition and situational awareness, we very well, and I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, I want everyone to be aware because children disappear, they get abducted all the time, and we may never be able to prevent it all the time, but we can some of the time. So when you're in a situation and you feel something isn't right, you do something. Yeah, because that's what's leading to all this human trafficking, which is terrible. Yeah. It's just, I mean, I, I just can't believe it's exploding as much, or maybe we weren't aware of it like we are now, but it's just a, it's a terrible thing. You know, you, you don't know. I mean, sometimes you're driving along and you see you know, a man or a woman or both, and you got a kid and sometimes they're hitting the window or they playing around, you, you know, who knows what to do? It's a scary situation. Yeah, it is. You know, it's, it's, it, what's that saying? If you see something, say something. And sometimes yeah. if you see something, do something. Yes. You know, I mean, if the little girl had said, oh, that's my daddy. Well, fine. But she didn't know who that guy was. And as soon as we were on the scene and the guy gave off every creepy vibe. I mean, when I used to represent some of the slimiest criminals, he was giving me the same type oh, of yeah. uh, feeling as that. And when we were on the scene, all of a sudden he made a beeline for his car and he was out of there. So um, he was up to no good. And, and of course, this is a dangerous world. But the thing is, we need to look out for each other because I'm an incurable optimist. And as gloomy and, and dangerous as the world may seem now, I have a feeling we're going to be OK. Yeah, it's just it's called communication and keep our eyes open, you know, pay attention. Too many people are on the phones and they don't see anything about them. You know, we need to put the phones away more often, you know, and, and um, not just have that focus because then we don't see things that are right in front of us. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you'll have to give uh, Rocky a, and yourself a pat in the back for, you know, saving uh, a little girl. Well, you know, I decided to write that um, for, I, I write every month for Best Holistic Life magazine. Nice. I decided um, I'm writing that in the August article. And um, I think it's important for people to know. And once again, I'm saying, you know, we're not there to pat ourselves on the back. We're, we're telling you that everybody has the ability to develop situational awareness. Put the phone down. OK, when you're in public, look around what you're doing. I mean, if you go to a grocery store or a public place, see where the exits are. If something happens, know where to go. If you're in an airport or traveling, don't wear flip flops. What if uh, something explodes and there's shrapnel all over the place? You need to wear shoes that you can run for your life in. Pay attention. Um, I saw a funny thing on Facebook. Um, there's all these people sitting in a park and they're all looking at their cell phones and Bigfoot's walking by. <laughs> and the subtitle says, this is why there's no recent pictures of Bigfoot. You know, because everybody's got their face in their phone all the time. And I do it too. And I, I have to stop and uh, make sure I put it away and pay attention to where you are. And especially with, with young children, we've got to be on the lookout, you know, um, look out for them. Um, you know, don't don't touch them. You know, don't take them. But, you know, ask them, you know, where's your mommy? Where's your daddy? Who's, who are you here with? Take me to that person because we didn't touch the child. OK, we know better than that. Yeah. But but she she was unprotected and and very vulnerable. Yeah. And the, the sad thing is children are very trusting. You know, um, you know, always how wonderful children are and all that. And, you know, yeah. we teach them to not be trusting, unfortunately, because we have to. Yes. And all I have to say is every mother, father, grandparents, take your child to the restroom, no matter how old they are. And never let yes. the child yeah, go. Absolutely. To I mean, public restrooms are a magnet for these predatorial yeah. personalities. And, and I'm uh, being very nice using that term. Yeah. Exactly. A um, couple of questions here. Um, who would benefit most from reading the afterlife frequency? I think anybody who wants to understand more about the afterlife and also to um, understanding how you can expand your awareness of signs and the presence of spirits. Um, also, I think anyone who really enjoys 
a good story um, because I try to write my books uh, like they're novels. I, I don't want to write boring algebra textbooks. I want you to be educated and, as well as entertained. It's the message I have for the world. The divine power, however you wish to perceive the divine, exists. That heaven, the afterlife, exists. We are immortal living beings, our souls. We can communicate with souls, and we will see our loved ones when we are supposed to leave this world and transition into the light. So how can our viewers um, reach you and get your books, The Afterlife We Could See, all your others? Yeah, the um, all my books are on sale worldwide. But if you go to my website, which is afterlifefrequency.com, just like my latest book, Afterlife Frequency, you can order. Uh, there's the links there to order it through Amazon, but they're also available at all fine bookstores and Barnes & Noble. Um, I also... Um, invite everyone to sign up for my newsletter that'll keep you up to date on my nationwide tour um i just spoke at the sedona spirits um ascension retreat and i'm heading next to the new living expo in san rafael then after that i'll be in tampa florida at the edgar casey um field conference on reincarnation then a week after that and i remember this one because it's on may 4th so may the 4th be with you <laughs> i'll be at uh, the edgar casey are in virginia beach for their reincarnation summit uh over the summer online i'll be um uh presenting at the Galileo Commission. And then in August, I will be at Helping Parents Heal Conference at Wild Horse Pass outside of Phoenix. And then I'll be back in Virginia Beach in October for the Ancient Mysteries Conference, where I'm presenting the secrets, mysteries, and curses of Tutankhamun's tomb. So it's a pretty busy um, year, and every Thursday night, at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, I co-host The Psychic in the Dock. That's a call-in show. It's a live stream show. And uh, my co-host, Dr. Pat Basile, is a world-renowned psychologist. So people call in. Um, I can do a reading for you. And then Dr. Pat helps you understand how the messages apply to your life. Nobody else is doing anything like this because we are the psychic in the dock. <laughs> so. That is so cool. Yes, I've had a couple of friends that actually call in and talk with you. So. Oh, cool. Good. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, well, yeah welcome all the, all the listeners uh, to call in and you can find out about all this on my website afterlifefrequency.com very good so when are you coming out here to the west coast um well i'm going to be in san rafael california but we're trying to get down to the la um you know burbank hollywood area so that's in the works as well and definitely judy we will Keep let you know yeah <laughs> well we greatly appreciate you talking uh, with us here at the hollywood times we have our uh, YouTube uh, channel, Hollywood Times Official, and this will be going up on our YouTube channel as well. And we'll share that with you. And we look forward to speaking with you again. And good luck with everything. And we can't wait to see you here you know, in the LA area, Hollywood. God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much.